Hi everyone, uh, I'm Lily. Uh, I'm a st student from UC Berkeley and I'm also part of AnyScale. So today I'm happy to give you the talk about uh, efficient LM deployment, a unified approach with Ray, VLM, and Kubernetes. So for today's talk, uh, I will begin by discussing like various uh, infrastructure challenges associated with generative AI workloads. Then I will cover like Kubernetes and Kubernetes, like how to leverage those two techniques to manage the um, clusters for those demanding applications. Then we'll talk about those Ray AI libraries, including Ray Data, Training, Serving, uh, and Ring 2. And lastly, I will also introduce VLM, an efficient like inference engine for LM serving. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so I will outline, so I outline three major challenges in generative AI workloads nowadays. So the first one is the scale, um, the scale of the models in, is numerous, and the second is um, um, the, the pipeline of those LM workloads are, right, are, are quite complicated. And lastly um, is, is the efficiency of those like um, LM serving um, is, is very low, like we don't have high efficiency. So I will dive them those challenges in one by one and then tell like how those like techniques can be used to solve those challenges. So first, um, as we all know, the past few years have witnessed the rapid growth of model size, like large language models. So if you look at the timeline here that we can see notable uh, model size, like uh, notable models like GPT-3, uh, Bloom, each progressively larger than its uh, previous generations. And as we move forward in time, the model size increased dramatically uh, with models reaching up to like hundreds of billions of parameters. And the trend is visible with examples such as like Llama 3.1 and 405 um, billion parameters or like Grok model with over 300 billion, 300 billion parameters or like GP, GP, uh, OpenAI GPT series. So why are the generative AI models uh, get bigger and bigger? So the reason is that as we increase the number of parameters, those models also tend to demonstrate better accuracy. So larger models are generally more capable of understanding complex language patterns, which improve their effectiveness across a wide range of tasks. So as we can see here, small models have limited capabilities uh, like uh, in areas like question answering or arithmetic. However, as models grow larger, not only do their question answering arithmetic uh, skills improve, but they also begin to demonstrate additional abilities such as like summarization, code, comp code completion. But at the same time, as the model grows larger, the compute required to, like, to train those models increase at, uh, increase at an extraordinary rate. So in fact, as illustrated here, training compute has been growing 10 times um, every 18 months. But in contrast, the Moore's law shows that general purpose CPU advancement grow at a much slower rate. So it doublings about every uh, 18 months. So there is a gap here between the uh, between the demand of the generate AI workloads and, and, the, and the supply we can provide by the, the current hardware. So as this gap grows, like specialized hardware like GPUs, TPUs um, are developed uh, to support like, like to support those, um, those workloads. Like we have NVIDIA GPUs, like AMD GPUs, TPUs, different hardware. Now question is that with those advanced hardware, specialized out of hardware, can we solve the problem? And the answer here is, it's not enough. So similar story, even with those specialized hardware, the gap between the demand and the supply increases 256 times every 18 months. So that being said, a single machine or a single hardware is definitely not enough to train those large language models. Actually, nowadays, as model grows larger and larger, um, a, a single node may not even be enough for serving the model. So let's talk about the scalability uh, requirements for the current general AI workloads today. So with a single node, uh, a single machine, maybe you have like multiple GPUs on a single machine, 
You can fine tune a small model locally on limited data set. This is feasible for model, t uh, for like for small tasks, but quickly become insufficient as models and data grow. To fine tune a middle scale model, you need a larger setup from one to 100 nodes. This allows you to distribute the model across multiple machines and leverage data parallelism to process larger data set efficiently. Uh, batch inference is also possible on larger scale, like unstructured data at this level. However, if you want to train a foundation model from scratch, like a model with billions of parameters trains on trillions of tokens, you need 100 or even thousands of nodes. So this is the scale at which major AI companies uh, operate on um, to develop state-of-art models. That being said, uh, with the such large scalability of current generate, generative AI workloads, you really need an AI infrastructure that can manage, observe such a large amount of data and compute resources. And the second challenge uh, in generative AI workloads nowadays is the complexity. So let me give you a very concrete example, ILHF. So what is ILHF? It's reinforcement learning with human feedback. So uh, it is a technique nowadays people use to improve the quality, like make the model safer, like uh, has a better quality, generate a better um, answers. So, uh, what is, so like GPT, uh, like GPT models, uh, most of the models nowadays we use, uh, they, are, they are trained uh, with ILHF. So what, what is IOHF really doing here? Let's look at those um, pipelines in more detail. So the first step, step of IOHF um, is, is do, you need to do some like fine tuning. So basically you will have some input data and you send to some labeler, you hire some labeler, you, labeler, you pay them the money to, uh, to, to let them generate the correct answer, like the good answer for those prompts. And then you fine tune the model on those data. The second step is, so the first step is just to make the model generate some, um, generate some reasonable output, so m instead of repeating the question. The second step is you will uh, use human feedback to improve the model. You will still hire some labelers, and you will give the labeler some like example answers, and you will let the labelers to decide which answer is better. And you use those information to train a reward model so what is a reward model? A reward model is saying that, oh, given the prompt, the model generates two answers, answer A and answer B. Which answer is better, right? So the reward model will tell us, oh, answer A is better than answer B. So this is a, a, like a judgment, right? So this is a reward model. And the last step, you train a policy model. So what is a policy model? So the, in the idea case, you want the, um, you want the uh, large language model to generate the, a good answer automatically. So what you will do is you will let the LLM to generate some answers and you will reward the model to score those answers. And you will give higher score to those good answers, give low score to those bad answers. And you will use those information to update the LLM model parameters so that the LLM can learn that, oh, I should always generate a good answer instead of saying some like uh, bad, out instead of generating some bad outputs. So those are the three steps uh, of uh, IOHF, and I think this is, um, this is very important for, now they, uh, for LLM to have a, a good performance. But if you look at this pipeline, it's quite complex. So you have like data, some data cleaning, data labeling, right? So you, you need to uh, prepare the data for the labeler. You also have some model inference, right? Because you are ask the model to generate some answer first and then ask a labeler to score which answer is bad, uh, which, which answer is good, which answer is bad, you also need to uh, sample some output, output to train the policy model. So you need to do the model inference. And also you need to do model training and you need to train three models, right? So first you need to fine tune the model to make the model gen generate some out reasonable output. Second, you need to train the reward model. So basically you need to know which answer is good, which answer is bad, so you need to train the reward model. And lastly, you need to train the policy model to update the large language model to make it generate the final output. So we need to train three models. As you can see here that a single IOHF pipeline, it involves uh, data processing, model inference, model serving, and model training. So what this means, it means that um, we kind of need a very, uh, we need a layered uh, like infrastructure 
so that those AI, AI scientists, machine learning scientists, they can focus on like data processing, model training, or model inference. And other people, like um, infrastructure, infrastructure engineer, they can handle those um, infrastructure stuff, like, uh, like how to handle the machines, how to handle the clusters. Basically, you want to separate the, separate the tasks because this pipeline is quite complicated. And the last challenge I want to um, mention today is about the LM serving efficiency. So serving large language models is surprisingly slow and expensive. Um, before VLM, um, let me give you a concrete example. A single A100 GPU, which is kind of advanced GPU, can serve only less than one request per second uh, for, for a moderate size of model, like 13 billion parameter model. It's a, it's a moderate size, it's not a very big, it's, yeah. But even with a moderate size model, you can only serve less than one request per second. Which it means like if you have hundreds of users or thousands of users, you need a tons of GPUs uh, to, to, to achieve a good performance. And we can see like questions like how do we, uh, how do we serve LLM more efficiently? So looking back on those, uh, looking back on those challenges, so what are the possible solutions? So Today, so I will dive into three directions to solve the challenges. The first one is Kubernetes plus Kubernetes. Um, they are, uh, the second is uh, Ray Data, Ray Train, Ray Server, Ray 2, which are those like Ray AI libraries to facilitate uh, the users to de develop AI applications. And lastly, I will introduce VLM. So let's dive into Kubernetes plus Kubernetes. Um, so this is a, uh, this is an overview of how Ray integrates with Kubernetes to create a scalable and a flexible infrastructure for AI workloads. Um, on the top level are different Ray AI library. Right? You have Ray data for uh, data for, man for, da for manage large scale data. You have Ray train to, uh, to do dis distributed model training. Like you have two, Ray 2 to do hyperparameter tuning, Ray serve for, to do model serving. And below the Ray AI libraries, you have the Ray core. So the Ray core layers, they include some like core functionalities and integrations that can power the distributed infrastructure. So this layer ensures that Ray can work across various environments from on-premise clusters to cloud-based solutions. And lastly, you have the uh, QB Ray. So QB Ray is highlighted in this slide um, as a critical uh, technique it's a critical integration point between Ray and Kubernetes. So Kubernetes manages the life cycle of Ray clusters and their applications within Kubernetes environments. It enables Ray workloads to be uh, orchestrated on Kubernetes. And the last layer at the bottom is a Kubernetes and cloud VMs. So Kubernetes provides a container orchestration layer which manages the develop, uh, deployment, scaling, and operation of Ray clusters and cloud VMs uh, allow the infrastructure to be scaled on demand, ensuring that resource can be uh, can match the workload requirements. So, what's the benefit of uh, of such a layered structure? So, this layered structure with Kubi Array provides a clear separation uh, between the uh, separation of the responsibilities between the uh, data and data ML scientists and the infrastructure engineers. So the data and M ML scientists, they only write some Python scripts uh, to, within the Ray environment to create different tasks to, to check the health, to handle like, those scaling requests for distributed AI workloads. And for those infra infrastructure engineers, they manage the Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes environment. They integrate Kubernetes with Kubernetes ecosystems, can use different tools we have in Kubernetes. So why do we want to use uh, Ray on Kubernetes? I think the, the answer is, um, is kind of um, obvious. So uh, we want to leverage those benefits of uh, Kubernetes, right? Like it has some infrastructure automations. Kubernetes automates the deployment scaling of those uh, containerized application, reduce the manual effort required to set up and maintain those infrastructure. Um, and also the scalability, so Kubernetes uh, has good design for horizontal scalability, making it ideal to scale those Ray clusters. And also like high availability, uh, reliability, 
um, resource efficiency, and a multi-cloud deployment. So all those benefits uh, make us want to leverage it, use the Kubernetes uh, within the, uh, with the ring. So uh, next, let's shift our focus uh, to like Ray Data, Ray Train, and Ray Serve, those Ray libraries, to enable the users to build AI applications without the need to manage underlying infrastructure. So the first is Ray Data. So what is Ray Data? So you can think of Ray Data as a last mile bridge. It connects the storage or the ETL pipeline outputs uh, to the distributed applications uh, within the Ray 6 ecosystem. So it enables the users to load and pre-process data for distributed machine learning training pipelines. And it offers some key features. For example, it can provide fast recovery from like out of memory error. It can support for heterogeneous clusters and it can generate, uh, it can guarantee data integrity, right? So we, it will not have any dropped rows during the distributed data set iteration. So after you get the data from the Ray data, you will, uh, you will go to Rain Train, right? So what is Rain Train? So Rain Train is just uh, an, easier, an easier way like for users to focus solely on the training logic without having to manage the infrastructure. To be more concrete, so what the user need to do? So user need to first uh, specify the desired setting, right? Like how many GPUs, how many CPUs to use, what are the resources I need? Uh, and the second, what is the training function, right? So they can use PyTorch, TensorFlow, and all other um, deep learning framework uh, to, to write their own training logic, right? Customized training logic. And then and next, the, the ring train uh, where, well, will distribute the training process uh, across multiple nodes without requiring the users to manually handle the details of like resource allocation, fault tolerance, or parallel processing. So after, after you train the model, you want to do the serving. So when you want to do the serving, you will do ring serve. So what is ring serve? Ring serve is a serving library. So, uh, it can it can uh, handle multiple like um, it can have uh, it can like provide the infrastructure to deploy and manage like ML models in production. So more specifically, it provides some like uh, important features. For example, it can do multi-server model deployment. So this is very important for large models, right? Like if if the model is like hundreds of billions of parameters, sometimes it will uh, scale multiple nodes to serve a single model. So you want to do multi-server model deployment. Uh, and also if the request rate is very high, you want to replicate the nodes. So uh, in that case, you might also want to have multiple, uh, multiple servers to serve the same model. And second, it can do auto-scaling. So RayServe automatically adjusts the number of instances based on the traffic. It will scaling up during the high demand and scaling down during the low demand. It also do load balancing, right? So it will evenly distribute the requests across available servers, maximizing performance. And lastly, it can do like failure recovery. Uh, it includes some built-in failure recovery mechanism to, ins to ensure the model availability and uh, resilience. And below the, below the RayServe is a VLM. So RayServe only handle like uh, multi-server development, deployment, auto-scaling, load balancing, uh, failure recovery. But what, uh, when you actually run the transformer models, you will use the inference engine, uh, VLM, which is also developed uh, uh, from UC Berkeley, uh, and I will dive into later. Okay, so let's dive into like uh, VLM. So what is VLM? Uh, so VLM is a fast and easy to use open source LM inference and serving engine. So it is a serving engine used by uh, RayServe. Uh, and actually many other companies. So we launched the project, the VLM project, in June 2023, when there were only a few open source projects for LLM serving. And fortunately, VLM got a lot of attraction from the beginning and has become one of the most popular projects in this field. We also get uh, many users across industry, including uh, major cloud providers like AWS um, and Google Cloud. So, so 
why is uh, VLM fast? So today I will only point out two features, but there are uh, actually a list of features that can enable the fast um, serving of VLM. So the one of the most important feature of VLM is continuous batching. So what is continuous batching? So when you do, when you do um, model inference, when you do like LM text generation, uh, it's actually very hard to fully utilize the GPU. Why is the case? Because when you generate the answer for a given prompt, you don't know the output length, right? Like for example, given the prompt, like what is your name? The answer can be my name is Lily, or my name is a, a very long word, or, or the, the model might have some chat, oh, thanks for asking the question, my name is blah, 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 blah. So you don't know the model output length bef in advance. So in that case, how do you do the uh, man memory management? So, so especially when you do the batching, when you batch different prompts in the same batch, and all of them might have different generation lengths, how do you batch them together? So the left picture is an example of a static batch. So basically you will assume that each request have a, fi have a fixed generation length. They will all generate 200 tokens, and you pre-allocate memory for those 200 tokens. But the problem is that in that case, you are wasting a lot of memory. You don't put enough requests in the same batch, and the GPU is underutilized. And what is continuous batching? So continuous batching is saying that uh, I know that we, uh, I understand that we don't know the output length of the, of the request, but let's still put them in the same batch, and we have some mechanism to separate them out when we finish the generation. So in that case, you can squeeze uh, different requests in the same batch and make sure that um, all the requests uh, can, can be run in a single forward pass so that you can increase uh, the GPU utilization. So that is continuous batching. So basically, batch requests of different lengths into the same batch to increase your batch size to reduce the waste of the, um, the memory. And the second reason is uh, VLM utilize efficient kernel and the memory management for attention operators. So we call it page attention. Um, and, and, and it can manage the KV cache like operating system virtual memory. Um, so instead of allocating the, the, the memory for the whole request, it ma manages the memory like block by block. So we have the idea of block, so basically the memory for each token. So it's a little bit complicated, so I, I, I encourage you to check out the page attention paper uh, for details. And, and also the same question, uh, why do people choose VLM? The reason is that the API is pretty easy to use. So if you have a, a, a GPU, uh, like you can, you can just try this, like pip install, VL, pip install VLM and, and you use the four lines here to try to run the like, large, large language model. Don't use like Llama 3.8b, it's too big, try a small model and maybe you can, uh, you can run it. And also VLMs have some um, other important features to make it uh, widely uh, adopted. So the first one uh, is, has broad model support. So like it's an official launch partner of Llama, right? Like well, support like Llama 400B, 70B, 8B. And it also, um, we also accept contribution from those um, state-of-art uh, vision language models uh, training companies like Picture or Q and v, uh, VL. And the last features uh, I, I just mentioned today is uh, for VLM, it has multi-hardware support. So uh, because VLM uh, it depends on PyTorch, um, and instead of relying on some external comp compilers or formats like Onyx, VLM directly use PyTorch as a narrow waste, a middle ground to connect different backends with hardware agnostic models and utilities. Okay, so with VLM, Razor, Kubernetes, Kubernetes, how will the end-to-end -end LVM serving architecture look like? So first, you will use VLM as an inference engine. And second, you will use Reserv, and Reserv will call the VLM, right? Like it will, uh, but Reserv will handle the model de deployment, scaling, request routing, load balancing, and fault tolerance. And on top of that, you will use Kubernetes to bridge the gap between the Reserv and the Kubernetes. And lastly, you will just use Kubernetes to do the container orchestration. 
So those four layers together uh, form a, a pipeline, an uh, end-to-end uh, architecture for the LM serving. Okay, um, so in conclusion, so today I talk about uh, the like, different challenges we have in generative AI workloads. Uh, and uh, I mentioned like the scalable infrastructure with Kubernetes and Kubernetes. Um, and also I introduced different array, like AI libraries uh, to improve the development efficiency of uh, end users. And lastly, I introduced VLM. Um, that's the end of this talk and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. With VLMs, um, when you're batching, I'm pretty old, but do the new A100s have some form of memory protection? Because when you're doing multi-tenancy on GPU memory, there's no memory protection inside. There's no TLB. There's no, nothing to protect your memory. Okay, thanks for the question. So no, the, answer, the short answer is no. Um, so currently, uh, for VLM, it's, um, we don't do multi-tenancy. So basically, a single GPU only hosts a single, a single model. Well, if you have multiple prompts coming in from different locations, even though it's a single model, that's the question I was having. So you're serving, mm -hmm. you have multiple users coming in with different prompts coming in, and you're batching across those different prompts. Then, they will be put in the same batch, but yeah. Is but, that the reason why sometimes you can get random responses from other people? Uh, not, 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 uh, not, not really. Like if the, 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 the inference engine is implemented correctly, it should not get the answer from, the, from other, from other users. But, uh, uh, but the output from the other user might affect the, uh, the numerical stability of the current user. They, they will affect each other a little bit, but you should not get the answer from, from the other user.